This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Michael Robinson. How are you, Michael? Doing good, James. Very good. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming on. You're a representative of the Tiger King. Everybody knows who he is. The smash hit show, yeah. Tiger King. It was Joe Exotic, mad bastard, if we're honest. Mad show. Everybody in the UK, I was engrossed in it. I loved it. I thought it was just fucking mad. Mad yeah. as a box of frogs. Everybody was on it. Like hillbillies just kind of arguing and fighting and trying to kill each other and killing lions and it was a mad show. Did did Joe know how big that show was going to be? No, I don't think. I mean, Joe had visions and dreams, right, of, of creating this because what most people don't realize is Tiger King really began in 2013. So it was something that they that you know Joe dreamed up and created, and then by the time Netflix jumped in, I don't think anybody had a clue. You know, I, I think even the producers involved, I know one of the main producers, JT, says all the time, he knew it was movement, but he had no clue. He was in New York City standing in Times Square, and all of a sudden, all the all the electronic billboards light up with Joe's face and Tiger King everywhere, and he went, that's the moment I knew we were in for something big. Yeah. So what's your connection with uh, Joe, Michael? So for so the viewers to understand... With- yeah, so I'm in front currently. I mean, my current position because Joe is running for president here in the United States. Uh, so I serve as a presidential press secretary. So moments like this, getting to speak for Joe, uh, specifically because Joe can't right now. But I've been friends with Joe for a long time. I'm in the exotic space, so I work with exotic animals, uh, specifically monkeys. And so a lot of folks know me as kind of the monkey man or whatever. We've got monkeys all over the place. And uh, the the exotic world is really small. So, you know, especially in the States. So you get to know everybody, although I've got friends over there in the UK and South Africa and places like that in the exotics world as well. But Joe and I crossed paths, became buddies and friends. And, uh, and, you know, all those characters in the Tiger King, uh, actually, I've I've interacted or or done some work with all of them in some form or another, including Carol Baskin. So, uh, all of us kind of crossed paths at one point or the other, and that's how Joe and I got to know each other. Before we get into Joe's case, because I know he's in solitary confinement just now, but well, I always go back to the start of my guest, Michael, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Absolutely. So I grew up here in Nashville, Tennessee. So I'm Southern, for sure, Southern, southern U.S. I uh, grew up here in the States and worked with animals my whole life. I kind of thought that's what I would do for a living. Actually, that's what prodded, I know right before we started recording, I was telling you guys, uh, during during my high school days and and, uh, into college, I studied at Dundee University with animal health and sciences over there in in, uh, Scotland. So I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. This is what, you know, my my dream in life was to just work with animals. And then I realized, like, I don't want to be a doctor. I just love animals. I just want to work with animals. So uh, I kind of walked away from veterinary school. And then uh, I spent a lot of a lot of my life in business as an entrepreneur and as a leader of a nonprofit. I actually pastored one of the largest churches here in the United States for a while. 
um, and, and loved it, but just being in public life and then working with the animals. And so uh, here I am, you know, working with Joe and, and serving Joe and using my voice to, to talk about what he's going through, his campaign, all that sort of stuff. And then being an advocate for the animals. That's a big, big deal for me, being an advocate for the rights here in the United States for people to, to do life with these animals, to share life with these animals. And so uh, it's, a, it's multifaceted, to say the least. So when you say you work with like endangered species and, and exotic animals, what sort of exotic animals can you work with in America that's legal? Because I know in Tiger King there was there was kind of you can't work with lions, but you can. You can have your own zoo, zoo, but you can't. So what was what is the ins and outs with exotic animals in the United States? Yeah, so a lot has changed and continues to change currently. So from the time the Tiger King came out, one of the, and, and people saw this in the Tiger King series, Carol Baskin was working very closely with U.S. government to change the laws so that no one could privately own a lot of these exotics, but specifically the big cats, tigers, lions, jaguars, cougars, things like that. So no longer in the United States is it legal unless you are a sanctuary or a zoo is specifically licensed for that, can you have those animals any longer? Uh, additionally, you know, chimpanzees, orangutans, like big apes uh, are no longer legal, certain birds. Uh, and right now, Carol's actually on a mission trying to pass another law to make it illegal for anyone in the United States to have a monkey. So she's trying to, to basically eradicate the rights for every American across the United States. And so, you know, she's been, she's been working on this. You know, we got email archives going back to 2016 where carol said when she was done getting rid of the tigers she'd get rid of the monkeys and then she just kind of keep going and you know she's walked away from being in the sanctuary world she doesn't work with animals anymore all she does is go back and forth to washington dc and lobby to change the laws and take away the rights of americans so carol and joe the two stars of the show were they close or not close but did they know each other before the tiger king yeah, they, they Carol spent almost 10, 10, 11 years trying to shut Joe down, and which is very interesting because Carol was in the same business. Like, she, Carol did the same. As a matter of fact, Carol did what she accused Joe of doing. Carol was a breeder of tigers and lions and exotic cats and made millions of dollars off of, of raising and selling these animals. And then, for whatever reason, she decided to stop it for everybody else. And so when Joe was exhibiting he didn't breed himself uh when joe was exhibiting those animals carol basically worked overtime for nearly a decade to shut him down every time he turned around so what was joe's business then did joe have the zoo with exotic animals yes so joe joe ran the gw exotic zoo in oklahoma uh that he you know started out of a passion project but he also did exhibits around the country to allow people to get up close and personal with you know baby tigers alliance things like that uh, doing shows across the country. He's an entertainer, and he wanted people to have the experience of being able to see the animals up close and personal, not just behind glass at a zoo or some some place like that, but to have a respect and understanding of the animals. And because Joe was was allowing people access to get close to the animals, the animal rights activists across, uh, well, not just in the United States, but across the globe, but also Carol and others felt like that was inappropriate and made it their mission to shut Joe down. Because Joe, he was doing YouTube videos beforehand. He was trying to get fame and popularity. Is that correct? He was, yes. So he had a group. Uh, there was a, a, basically, they had the Tiger King sold to a different network at one point. They had already filmed everything, put it all together. And if you'll remember in the Tiger King, uh, Saf had uh, their arm ripped off by one of the tigers yeah the women the when girl. that yeah so when that happened then the original network that was involved in the production of the show decided they were no longer willing uh to air air the show which i'm sure there's some executive in the entertainment industry now sitting back and thinking man what a mistake we made it would have been a giant success but because someone was injured by an exotic animal they chose not to actually release the show and so it sat for a few more years until netflix picked it up so see, because of the Tiger King, would Joe be in prison if Tiger King wasn't available for anybody to see? Was it I don't Tiger King so. the downfall of Joe, or was he always going to go to prison? No, I think Tiger King. I think Tiger King is why. No, well, actually, let me back up. 
Joe was in jail before the Tiger King came out. I think that the Tiger King gave leverage for uh, the federal government here in the United States to form a better case because they were able to use the information from filming and the narrative created by the entertainment executives uh, to to further a conviction. Uh, I don't believe Joe would still be in prison today if it weren't for the show. So I do believe the show caused a lot of, of grief and trouble for Joe. I mean, while it's given a lot of other people fame, a lot of folks don't realize they, they I think people believe that Joe has made a lot of money. He's gotten famous. You know, he's he's uh, you know, he, he's got all this stuff from being the Tiger King. But, you know, what people have to understand here in the United States, when you're a federal inmate, you're no longer allowed to make an income. So Joe being in prison before the show came out allowed him or, or disallowed him, did not allow him the opportunity to profit from, from the show. So Joe being one of the biggest celebrities in the world over the last few years, especially during the pandemic, you know, Joe is this massive celebrity and yet he has no benefit from that because he was in federal prison. In fact, Joe has never seen an episode of the series Tiger King. Joe's never even been able to watch it for himself. So Carol Baskin, Michael, they spoke about her husband going missing, but then I've read that he was actually found and that people are saying that she killed him, but then the article's just, I think it was this year actually, that it was actually found in Mexico or Brazil. How true is this and is it all speculation? Like, What is the actual story? Do you know? Uh, you know, I, I don't know for fact, and I don't think anybody but Carol and maybe a handful of very close, you know, friends of Carol know the real facts, but I would, I would venture to say that Dawn still being alive today is not factual. I do believe, in fact, that he was gotten rid of. I think that Carol made sure he was dead and gone in order to benefit financially because she was done using him and she wanted access to his money. The people closest, his own children, his personal assistant for all those years, I mean, they, they kind of vouch for it too because I feel like those individuals, if they knew he was alive, I mean, they would they would come forward with the truth. Because they're actually good people. They're not just trying to take Carol out just just because they don't like Carol. They would just let the truth be known. Uh, but I believe that Carol had a hand in making sure that Dawn disappeared permanently. Uh, you know, and here recently she's gotten rid of her her zoo. She's donated the animals. She's gotten rid of her property. Maybe there's a chance somebody can find something on that property, but I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know the truth unless Carol has a moment of deciding to be honest for a change. When did the Tiger King get made then? So the Tiger King was made, it was released, but Joe was already in prison? Yes. Yeah. Because so the Tiger, the Tiger King, King made out, it made out as if Joe was still out and then he just got charged when the Tiger King was released or after it got released. So he, Joe was already in prison? He was in prison before any of us ever even knew what the Tiger King was. So Joe, Joe went into prison about a year prior uh, to the release of the series. And so the series that the footage that you see in the series, they began capturing that footage 10 years ago in 2013. And so that was the footage used for the previous series. Tiger King, uh, the, the producers of Tiger King from Netflix came in, filmed additional, continued, you know, the story uh, before and after with Joe that added to it. Um, but a good majority, almost all of the footage that you watch in the pilot was shot by the original producer, J.T. Barnett, who actually created the series for a different network. And so uh, they, they, you got almost a decade of footage and information and story in the midst of all of this. And then you've got, uh, you know, you've got the supposed producer, the guy uh, in this series who came along saying that he, you know, he shot all this, he did all that. They hired him right towards the end. He was fired right towards the end. He barely had anything to do with it, but they used him as the main character. Because again, what we see on television or what we see in movies, uh, you know, often is recreated just for the entertainment value. So a good majority of what you see in the in the series Tiger King, it's not the act actual facts of what's really going on. What sort of animals did Joe have on the zoo? Yeah. So Joe had tigers, chimpanzees. He had all kinds of monkeys. Uh, I mean, kangaroos, wallabies, I mean, you name it. it. It was a real zoo, with truly with all kinds of animals. I mean, the primary thing that Joe obviously had there were the big cats. So the tigers, ligers, lions, 
you know, that was that was Joe's passion. Uh, he has a gift for it. It's it's really unlike any I've ever seen. I've never seen a person be able to work with those animals the way that Joe naturally was able to do that. And so he put a lot of effort and energy and had one of the one of the most specialized and high end uh, zoo properties in the country that was privately owned. That was not a you know a public zoo or a government funded sanctuary. Because it just looked crazy though when you mentioned that girl who lost her arm and people were getting attacked it looked it's not a zoo i would go to let's put it that way michael it right. just looked fucking crazy and yeah. you've stayed in dundee and dundee's fucking crazy but that that yeah. just takes things to a whole new level so how, how safe was it actually for people to go around in the tours i think we've got one here in scotland uh blair drummond i think it's called where you drive around with the car but the lines i think are sedated they don't really move but joe's yeah. lines seem to be they weren't sedated really. So how no, safe was yeah. that? So it was it was safe because you have you have regulations to that. So again, what you saw in the series is definitely not this you know, not the reality. We have regulations, even here, you know, it just twenty feet behind me out in out in the back of my house, I have monkeys, right? And out there I have to have six foot tall perimeter fences that are so many feet away from enclosures so that a person can't put their arm through and touch or any of that stuff. So the general visitor to Joe's zoo did not have any type of physical direct contact with the larger animals. Now Joe did allow them to, to pet and take pictures with baby animals, but with the big animals, no, a, a few, you know, other than the staff who worked at the zoo. And this is a reality. Like those of us who work with exotic animals, uh, I just took in a, a, a set of new monkeys here. Uh, that are older adults and you know I've been bit I, I've needed stitches you know you get you get injured when you work with uh, wild animals and so you know even Saf who lost their arm you know for Saf they went right back to work you know they just understand this is par par for the course and what you don't see in that entire deal is that Saf was playing with the animal uh, during feeding time with a stuffed animal because these tigers, when they're raised by humans, they're like house cats. They're really incredible creatures. They're really kind of chill, but they're still a predator. They still, you're talking about an animal whose claws are two, three, four inches long, big teeth, you know, and when they want to play rough, they're much bigger, much stronger, much more capable. And the entire process of Saf losing their arm was about a literally a three to five second moment of playtime with that tiger where they just snatch the arm right off what's the most endangered species you can work with michael you know i mean depending on if you're licensed for it you can work with you can still work with tigers you can still work with chimpanzees animals like that here in the united states i mean for me uh i'm licensed in different ways i mean the only thing that inhibits me personally from working with any of these really endangered exotic species is a facility you, your facility has to be at a certain standard in order to have those animals. Uh, and again, they, this is the cost. Now, this is the other thing that a lot of people don't realize. Feeding, like feeding a full-grown tiger for a year costs anywhere from five to $10,000 just for the food. So it's a very expensive thing to take care of these animals. Chimpanzees are much the same. They, they can cost up to $100,000 in a year to care for. So, you know, I've got spider monkeys here. My spider monkeys, the average spider monkey will cost me $10,000 just to feed every year. So it's a, it's a very expensive venture. For most people, it's, it's really limited by your education that you have, your licensing that you have, and then the facility. So as long as your facility meets complete standards, we're getting ready to upgrade here uh, as a facility so that a certain species of monkey that are going to be outlawed uh, in the state where I live have a place to go so we can provide sanctuary for them long term but it's a it's a process you know i have to build nine foot perimeter fences around the entire property i have to build you know certain types of enclosures that meet all these standards by the zoological association of america and so there are there are a lot of parameters around it but the the reality is is if you've got the funding and you have the resources to put the facility together and the right staff you're really still able to work with these animals, but the private individual in America is very limited with the, with almost no options any longer. Yeah, I'm fascinated with so many animals on this planet. And I'm going off topic here, but I'm just intrigued with animals and 
why they're here. And when you look at, I've seen videos, you see videos of people working with lions when they're cubs and the lions yeah. love them and they run to them to cuddle them. Do you see when people think they're dangerous, when you actually work with them as pups and cubs and just newborns that they actually love their owner just the way a dog does? Uh, do you see yeah. the love and compassion or do they go into that mode where I'm still a fucking lion, but don't piss me off? Well, you know, the, the answer to your question is actually yes to both, both of those, right? Like these, when these animals are raised by a, a human being, there's a trust built. So there's a, there's a level of bonding and trust that never goes away. So you can still work with the animal. However, they're still wild animals. And this is what I, you know, I try to tell folks even, I mean, I've got a 12 pound monkey here. That's at maturity that I did not raise, but like I can go sit with him in his enclosure He'll cuddle with me. He'll love on me. But if if he has a moment where he's frustrated, he's he's a testosterone raging primate, and he gets upset, and he will absolutely tear me up very quickly. It's a natural response, and I, I you know I tell folks working with monkeys in particular, but this is true with uh, say a tiger. Tigers are natural predators, right? So there's a natural instinct and you don't breed out instinct and you certainly don't train out instinct. It's literally hardwired into the DNA. So, you know, short of understanding the animal, you know, nonverbal communication and cues that you get when you work with these animals um, and then just a deep respect for the animal. The truth is you're going to have moments. Nobody that works with these animals up close and personal goes without injury. It really does happen. And that's the risk you take working with animals. And, you know, there's folks out there who go, that's why take the risk or, you know, shouldn't be available to take the risk because it is a great risk. But the truth is man and animal have interacted for thousands of years. I mean, we can go back to, you know, the, the hieroglyphs in the pyramids and see, you know, ancient Egypt. I mean, this is just it's just a reality of our what, what I say in a traditional point of view is we're at the top of the food chain, really. So our ability to have dominion over the animal kingdom and to be able to enjoy it, it's a beautiful thing. And I think that, you know, we, we often forget because we try to put everything in a category of, say, a pet. So we think dogs and cats. But, you know, again, thousands of years ago, a dog or a cat was a wild animal. So at, at some point, and I don't think that we need to go domesticate all of these exotic animals. I don't think we need to do all those things. But the reality is, is these animals come into captivity. They come in through import. You know, a lot of the monkeys that are part of the United States come in because of medical testing. So where our own government funds the process of going and capturing all of these monkeys in Africa or South America or, you know, different places. And they, they bring them over on a boat and they come through and then workers take one home or get babies or they sell them and they end up in the pet trade here. They're going to, it's going to continue to happen. You don't stop it. But the reality is, is that for all of us, we, we really, we got to be educated. You know, I mean, we see it often with dogs and cats, but we've gotten so commonplace because they're everywhere. You know, we don't think about it, but how often do people not know how to care for their animal? How often does a dog injure its owner, you know, bite its owner or a child in the home or those sorts of things. But because there's so many of them, because it's become so common, we don't have the same mindset. So then when we see some big exotic animal that injures a caregiver or acts like a wild animal, we act really surprised. And yet that's true of every animal on this planet. See, when you're working with monkeys and an expert in monkeys, how do you think the connection is between monkey and, and human? Do you think we've evolved from monkeys? Because I, I'm skeptical of everything and like to ask the questions. I've seen, like, I don't know if it's chimpanzees or, or silverbacks. You see their fingerprints in their hands that say yeah. they're very they're very human-like. But do you feel there is a connection that we have evolved from monkeys or do you feel as if it's something else? You know, I don't, I would not be one to say that we are evolved from a non-human primate. I, I don't, I don't ascribe to that belief. But I will tell you, working with them, and chimpanzees are a great example. I've worked with a lot of chimpanzees over the years. Chimpanzees are eerily close to humans, and it really is an awe-inspiring thing. I remember really kind of the first time I worked with an older chimpanzee. She was 38 years old, and I walked away. I was like, if that, if that animal could talk to me, that's as human as you could possibly get, right? But at the same time, there's enough of an animal there to go, 
we didn't involve, there's too much difference in my opinion to say that we directly, in, you know, evolved from it. But I think that there's a lot of, you know, cross understanding. I mean, I have a creation view of the world and, and the reasons we exist. I mean, I have a deep faith. So, you know, because of my belief system, because of the way I was raised, it's hard for me to ascribe to an idea that we evolved from them, but the similarities and the common characteristics between us. And I mean, even the spider monkeys and the things that I work with on the daily basis, there, there are very much times that it's, it's really interesting, you know, it challenges my thought process a lot to think about how human-like or, or the term would be sentient, but how sentient these beings are and how much connection there is and how much emotional connection there is that you don't have with any other animal that I've ever worked with, you know. What's the best monkey to work with? Oh gosh, am I? I mean, it's it's biased though. I mean, my personal opinion, either spider monkeys or howler monkeys. I just think their disposition and their their character and and their uh, demeanor is just the best of the best. How loving are they and affectionate? Do they show love or, or are they quite cold towards a human? Oh, James, there uh, it's unbelievable. I mean. My my spider monkeys that I have personally, I mean, they when they come in, like they spend their days in their outdoor enclosure. They have a big natural environment, uh, but they come in to sleep in a in an enclosure that's built onto the in, onto my home. While like my evenings, they just want to sit and cuddle. They 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 vocalize things. They you know they they've accepted me into their troop, or I brought them into my troop. However that term looks, but they're very much a part of our family. They're very much part of our home. Um, and it's very evident. I mean, it's it's extremely evident when they're not feeling good. They want to be held when they are, uh, you know, upset about something. They want to be protected. It's I, I being a father of seven children, like there's there's not a whole lot of difference to me in these these monkeys to what their needs are as what my kids were when they were three, four or five years old. So I feel like their their intelligence level and their needs, their emotional needs and psychological needs are right on par with a small child. So the the connection, the affection, all of those things, it's it's very, very unique and it's deep. It's very deep. They're saying there's a lot of animals will be extinct by the end of 2030. How true is that? And is that the greed of other humans just being vicious and murderous kind of torturing animals yeah i think that falls i mean my opinion on that i are animals in danger of being extinct yes and 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 at all times the biggest culprit of that is humans but not in the way we think because the narrative for you know climate change and you know destruction of environments and all of these sorts of things they do that matters right like i don't know about climate change i'm not a big believer in climate change i think it's a bunch of you know bullshit that people have spun out there but the reality is like the way it, i mean carol baskin's a great example for the united states there are more captive tigers in the united states than there are in the wild naturally left on this planet but what people don't understand is the natural environment for a tiger for instance there's only about five thousand acres left on this planet that are considered natural environments for those animals because Human population has expanded. It's taken over those places, right? And were it not for captivity and captive breeding programs, those tigers would be critically endangered, if not extinct at this point. And what Carol's done is passed this law saying that it's not right for humans and animals to interact and that tigers should not have any type of human caregiving or human interaction or captivity. And it's also ended the breeding program. So the zoos and sanctuaries and whatnot are not allowed. They have to sterilize their animals. They can't breed them. And what you're going to see, I think, in, in 20 or 30 years is that the, the tigers go back to being critically endangered, if not eventually becoming extinct, because we got woke on some level and worked to protect the animal. For, to to basically treat the animal like the, the the animal rights people here in America specifically, but it I mean PETA's everywhere. They kind of talk about animals in captivity like it's chattel slavery. So they go back to our roots as American history of owning slaves and all this kind of stuff. They, they talk about it that same way, and it's it's a ridiculous you know, over characterization and over humanization of these animals. But then they damned these animals 
to potentially going back to being in a critically endangered and or extinct because they no longer allow a human population to to breed and propagate these animals to make sure they're around. I, I you know, I, I'm concerned that my, there's certain animals and tigers being one of them that my grandkids will never be able to experience because we made laws to protect the animals saying they're going to go extinct when in reality we've been protecting these animals from from that kind of a, a, a extinction or danger just by taking care of them. It just fascinates me with so many different animals. You you look at some of these safaris where you've got giraffes and rhinos and hippos and it's just so fascinating who created the animals and how beautiful they are when you see them all different and listen, it's survival mode as well where people need to survive and it's a free for all but it's just so fascinating the animals of the uh, for me it's animals over humans humans are f- fucking they're fucked up mate if we're honest <laughs> yeah, I, we're agree. All I agree fucked with you. up man so it's just when you see I, I love animals I'm a dog person I just love dogs and but any animal any animal that's friendly enough if I see an animal that's friendly uh, it's made my day it's just yeah the, the, it's the joy they bring they bring some different energy than a human and it's unbelievable what they can actually yeah do to make someone happy and there's a true saying uh, dogs are a it, it's an friend. interesting thing you know one project that i'm personally working on uh with a great group of people we have a foundation called the ido foundation so here in the united states they have outside of a dog or a cat they have made it illegal to use animals for therapy but you know every day like i get to interact with these animals right and and i have good days and bad days you know recently i've had a group of crazy fucked up humans is the best way to put it that have you know they made threats against my family they've made threats against my work my life because they just don't like the work that i do and um you know when you have a day that's stressful uh you run into things one of the things that's a really nice beautiful reset that really helps my mental health but also just helps my emotional stability a lot of days is the fact that i get to go sit with these animals and just experience them and i'm away from human craziness and i'm away from the world and i'm just in the midst of for all intent and purpose i'm in the midst of nature getting a pure place because these animals just like a dog or a cat i mean they all come to us with just a, a pure existence right they don't have an agenda for us other than be, being fed you know they don't really have an agenda with humans so you, you either have a connection or you don't you're if you know if you're a genuine person going into this the beautiful connection that we share with animals is unbelievable and so you know, one of the projects that we're hoping to bring to life here in the here in the U.S. and I'd love to see it across the globe is to build these retreat centers with sanctuaries that coexist together, where folks who are suffering from trauma or PTSD, depression, anxiety, you know, all the things that we as general humans in a busy world with all the all the craziness that we have to deal with, you know, we we suffer at times from those those mental and emotional struggles. And to be able to come in and, and serve the animals, like it's not just to come in and get to take pictures and love on an animal. I think like, you know, th- that that I'm not crazy about, but like to get to come in and work with these animals to protect them, to to get some purpose around you doing something good for the plant, for the animals, for yourself, but then get to experience the connection with the animals. I believe it could be a crucial key in the future of communities here in the U.S. and across the globe to really help with mental health. To get away from the junk pharmaceuticals, all the drugs people get shoved down their throats or drinking themselves to death to escape those mental struggles and anxieties, but to really reconnect with the, uh, a natural resource that's right at hand for us, you know, to, to restore. And that was a big piece, like for Joe Exotic, a big part of his opening up those experiences for people with the GW Exotic Zoo and the, the exhibitions that he did all the time was really to bring a moment of joy a piece of hope, uh, you know, a little bit of restoration to, to just stabilize somebody's ups and downs in life and put a smile on somebody's face. There's there's absolutely beauty in it. And because we're, for all intent, we're, I hate the term, I just don't know a better term for it, James, but because we've become so woke as, as a modern society across, whether it's America or anywhere else, we're so woke at, at protecting all these things and, and whatever those things are that we're destroying the natural beauty that's right in front of us and we're limiting the opportunity because I think that, you know, whether you believe that there's there's a creator and a God who put all this stuff together or it's a big bang theory and we're all going through an evolution, there's still these natural things that are existing in our world that provide remedy 
for the struggles that we go through. And I think, you know, when we just accept that and go, hey, I get it. Like, I am I am a major understanding proponent of, hey, a wild animal should be wild. I don't disagree that they shouldn't all be in captivity. The problem is once they're in captivity, you can't just take them back out and go run free. You know, they, they don't they don't live. They don't exist. Somebody's got to care for them. And because we're caring for them, we have a benefit. So we serve them. We get benefited. It's a mutually beneficial relationship that should exist. And there's a beauty in it for us. You know, just like you you love animals. And like you said, the reality is, is we don't do that for each other's human beings anymore. Something about the culture across the globe has broken down where we don't lean into one another as human beings and go, I just be present, be a friend to you. How do I just be present? And sometimes they think that's all you need to do is just be present. But like we've become so selfish and so self-consumed with our own needs that we're not serving other people. And that's the beauty of this relationship that we have with these animals is that's just not the way they are. You know, they're, they're it's just an open, mutually beneficial existence. And there is a absolute incredible resource at hand that we've continued to shut down. Yeah. Well, what ha what's happened to America though, Michael? Same as the UK. The UK is an absolute mess right now. It's fucked up. The laws are fucked. There's a movement, and it's just it's not a good one. America, I know obesity is on the rise, and mental health and pharmaceutical industries. So many people addicted to pharmaceutical drugs. There, why did where did it get so messy? Do you think for the human mind and the body that we've just let ourselves go so much? You know, I, I, I kind of look at everything and I've said this in, 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 for instance, with Joe's entire story of being in prison too, it's the same answer that really applies to all of it is greed, greed and power. And, you know, the, the reality is, is that we've created this society where people are still entitled to have so much and entitled to not have to work at something and entitled not to have to, to be a part of society. Like there's this mental, I think it's a mental health issue. It says, I get to be me and fuck you if you don't like it. And if you don't like it, you're you're a Nazi, you're a racist, you're a, you know, whatever term you want to put on it. You know, uh, there's all these things that people say, but like obesity is a great example. Like obesity is a death sentence, man. Like, you know, you think about diabetes, cancer, respiratory, heart issues, all of these nasty things that come out of being obese. And, and then people will turn around and they glamorize it. You know, you got celebrities who are overweight and then they're being put on the cover of magazines and called the standard of beauty. It's like, I'm not calling you ugly. I'm not trying to tell you you're a horrible human being. But when I glamorize this, then a young generation looks and goes, well, if I'm a fat ass, who cares? But what happens is you're damning these kids, you're damning a generation of people to die a miserable death, to live a miserable existence, to be a drain on society. But then we protect it. And, and it's just, it, it's, it's a mental health issue that's driven by greed because the pharmaceutical companies then create more drugs and they get you dependent on the drugs and, you know, the mental health stuff. I mean, social media sure hasn't helped. I don't blame social media. I, do, I just think it's one proponent of, of things where people get into this mental health cycle of I don't look like that person. Or, I don't fit in like that person or I don't have the fame that person has. So then they feel depressed because we've taught people it's not okay to just be you to just be normal, to just be average. It's not It's not about mediocrity versus superiority. It's about just being a human being. You know, in America, one thing that drives me nuts is that you've got this entire society here who's no longer happy just to own a basic home, raise their kids, drive, have, be able to drive a car and have a job and pay their bills. Like there's this, this misconception that you've got to be wealthy and you've got to be known and you've got to have all these things. And so then people are discontent and it leads to mental health and struggles and anxiety and depression and fear. And then the pharmaceutical companies go, great, we can make a ton of money. We'll pump it in. We'll make you dependent. This drug makes you sick. This drug makes you gain weight. This drug will make you lose the weight. But when you lose the weight, you're going to have more mental issues. So you're going to take, you know, it's just, it's this chain reaction of greed and hour that just continues to happen. And yeah. I think it all stems from a mental health issue that we haven't looked at people and said, you know what, you're okay just the way you are. Like it's it's okay. Yeah, it's crazy though because people are so lost, like you say, with social media. Social media is a great tool for business, but even then, you can get lost in it by sure. craving something that's electrical. It's just a number. It's like a time you're watching. It's just numbers going up and down, and right. people feel as if they're inadequate. 
fat people in front of magazines saying big and proud, but it's not. You're talking about heart disease, diabetes, cancers. People are brainwashed now. We've got fucking men. I've seen like 12 men in the front of a magazine with blood on their pants saying men can have periods. And I'm just thinking this place is going nuts. And if you speak out, you're wrong and you're bad. You're a homophobe. You're fucking transphobe. You hate fat people. You just hate the world. I'm, I'm just speaking facts. I'm speaking science. Yeah. I'm speaking just natural facts where, wait a minute, men can't have periods. Men can't have babies transgender i don't care if you're trans I always speak about it lately, right but i genuinely don't care if you're trans gay bi i don't give a fuck just stay away from kids don't preach it to right. kids. don't take it into schools don't bring different flags into so schools true. keep your politics away from sports just let people go on with their life there's so many people who are straight and trans and bi who just live their life and raise a family but yes there's just so much fuckery now when the news and the tvs and it's making people scared and you're questioning it and you question yourself and you think is this right is this wrong but when you strip it all back the science is there men can't have yeah. babies men can't have a period if you're overweight then there's more chance to get a heart attack liver failure yeah. heart disease cancers diabetes it's, it's, it's just common knowledge but it, it's, don't it's wild because you know, one of the things that I run into here in the, and I would, I would have the same issue in the UK. So it wouldn't be any different in the UK as in the US. But I, I am gay. I have a husband, but I am completely anti transing kids. I don't want you educating my young children about gay, bi, trans, any of that. Like that's my, first of all, that's my job. I'm a parent. I'm supposed to take the responsibility to educate my kids on anything when it comes to identity, sexuality, politics, all of that. That's my job. That's how it's supposed to be. Like that's what the parents don't take responsibility for anything anymore, which is part of the problem. But, you know, when I speak out and say, quit, quit cutting a 12 year old kid's breast off or penis off and tell them that it's OK to just decide today I'm going to be a girl and tomorrow I'm going to be a boy. Like if we you know, I think back to when I was a kid, there's all those things you wanted to be when you were a kid. You don't want to be a superhero. You wanted to be a little, you know, I, I pretended I was a dog. I remember when I was a kid, like, <laughs> you know, the, the, the mental health that you've got to go through to say. We justified one version of this and not another. And, you know, the misconception and, and somebody that I deeply respect, I've been talking a little bit with her her folks about doing some content together because I love J.K. Ralph. Like, J.K. has done a great job of speaking against it because, like, like what you just said, J.K. has no issue with trans people. I have great friends who are trans people, but they are adults who made understandable decisions at a time in life where they're able to to, to grasp, like, if I do this, it's a permanent decision, you know, permanently altering my existence and my health and my body. And that's your choice. I'm cool with that. Whatever you want to do, do your thing. You know, and I'm also the type of person that you know, I come from a, a conservative, religious, traditional, you know, family and culture. Like there's a lot of people who have a problem with me because I have a husband. That's OK. You're entitled to your belief. It's fine. I'm not getting it. I don't need to change your mind. It's OK to disagree with me. But where we where we've gone too far, like you said, is these idea ideologies that we're justifying, you know, obesity like it's beautiful instead of calling it what it is, it's dangerous. So we're justifying mutilating children for the sake of a moment of emotion to feel like I don't fit in, you know, because a girl's a tomboy and likes to wear blue and play ball instead of play with Barbies and wear dresses. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, we need to make a fake penis and cut your breasts off. Like what? Who? What what jacked up mental health reality is this? And when when we as and it gets said here in America a lot, there's a trans genocide going on. You know, we're trying to kill off all the trans I'm like we're not. You know, who's killing off all the trans people is all the woke liberals who are transing all the kids because they're sterilizing all of them. And in a generation from now, they won't exist. It's not the conservative mindset who says, hey, this isn't OK. That's a problem that's killing off the trans trans population in america it's the trans supporting people who think it's okay to mutilate a kid they're the ones killing everybody off they're the ones committing the genocide and so we just flipped all this and i feel like nine out of ten times when it comes to politics and the news and everything that we see and read and hear all over the place whatever you whatever you read in the newspaper whatever you see on mainstream television anywhere in media just realize the opposite is the truth because they're giving us this spun narrative that's upside down. And they're lying to us every time we turn around. And that's how they're continuing to manipulate the system. That's why political leadership is 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 screwing the whole world up. Because they get up and they literally tell you what, what they're not doing. 
And you should just be woke enough to go, they're probably doing exactly the opposite of what they're saying. And they're stealing my rights and they're taking my money and they're, they're destroying things, you know, and it, it's just, it's unbelievable. And what's really sad to me is that we have, we've stopped people. And this is true everywhere. I've, I've traveled to 91 countries. I've lived abroad. I don't just have this American point of view, you know, everywhere I've been and I've seen it in other countries before I saw it here. So it's really alarming to me to see it, but we've we've made it impossible or we've told people it's impossible or it's illogical to ask questions and think for yourself like they you're supposed to just take the narrative and believe it and we've stopped like we've told people like it's a crime and they, they're trying to do that with laws here in the united states i mean they're passing laws in certain states here where if you misgender somebody you could face jail time like how ridiculous is that like if you got a penis you're a, you're a male you want to dress like a woman, fine. But like, you got a penis, you're a male. Like, don't put me in jail for that just because I'm stating the obvious, right? But this is the kind of junk that we're doing. And what we're what we're doing is this generation, we're a few generations in, at least here in the United States, where people don't know how to ask questions and think for themselves. History keeps being rewritten. We're not being told the facts anymore. We're being given a propaganda and narrative that leads us down a route to believe things that aren't true. And as a result, this is why, and, and Tiger King's a great example, the entire story that people think they know about Joe, you know, they think they, that Joe was killing tigers because he needed more room in his zoo. Not that he was euthanizing a sick or elderly animal that wasn't going to survive. They, they think that, they, 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 I mean, all of the things, and this is how it goes in all of the news cycles and all of the entertainment cycles. They tell you what they want you to believe because they get your interest and your emotions into it. And then we just settle into believing and we don't step back and go, hmm, I wonder what the facts actually are. I wonder where the truth actually lies in whatever's happening in our in our countries, in our culture, in our cities, in our townships, our villages, wherever we live. What's really happening? Yeah, because but the, the power of the media, it can manipulate so fast and so easy. Look at lockdown. The lockdown the world. People were too yeah. scared to leave their house. People are still scared to leave their house. For yes, a virus that was ninety nine point nine percent safe. It was right, and it's just the human mind can be so dumbed down. And this is the scary facts of human beings. We're so manipulated; it's unbelievable. And like you say, I agree with everything you say. I've got friends of every race, every fucking gender. Be who they want to be. I've got trans people who's been on the podcast who I fucking love to bits, but they're crazy, Michael. They admit they're crazy. They admit body dysmorphia was a thing of mental health just a few years ago. It doesn't just then go up and vanish. The majority yeah. of people who want to be trans and cut off their tits and their dick is a mental health issue. You've yeah. got to speak facts. And it's not that they're bad people, but we can't promote it as normal. As long as Oh, drag shows no, uh, nobody cares about drag shows it's just right. you know, the kids get involved and keep it 18 plus as simple right. as that Sam Smith's kind of doing his thing on stage right. which I don't agree with and he's doing mad shit and it looks all satanic to me and it looks as if people can be lost in that loop where they're trying to feed it and normalise it but it ain't normal yes. and people like myself yourself who speak out about it we get ridiculed we get cancelled we get told to shut up and be quiet but no, because I've got trans friends, but they don't phone me to come up and read stories to my kids at night time. Right. I would fuck right. if, I, if my straight friends done that, I would be fucking telling them to fuck off. Do you know what I mean? Right. So it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, just leave the kids alone. I just think they're trying to normalise paedophilia. I feel as if well, they're trying to normalise the age of consent to bring it down lower. I just feel as if they're trying to normalise so much madness and it makes you think that you're going insane. And I do question, am I in the wrong? Because when you speak out about it, you get there's a wave of hate, and it's fucking strong. That's, it's not just a lot of people believe in it, but a lot of people are too scared to speak out about it. So, but it's kind of you're like a lone wolf with a lot of this stuff, yeah. and sometimes you just feel it like going quiet because it can be damaging to the mind because it's a constant battle of what, and I feel as if the media want that battle with everybody fighting and arguing and hating each other. And, then, then they're winning instead of making a stand and actually right. standing against the people in power. Well, we, you know, and, and here's what's sad to me, and and actually it really stands out to me because you know it was a it was a you know a media sensation here when I was in high school. But you know, I think about this just a cro crossover with the culture where you're from, but the culture that built every nation on this planet. 
But when when the movie Braveheart came out, you know, everybody gets inspired by the character of William Wallace, right? And so you're inspired by it. Well, then I end up coming over there and living for a while. And so I go to see, like, I want to really get into this history. Who's Robert the Bruce? Who's William Wallace? Like, how's what is this real story? But what's really underneath the story, and, and I'll tie this in here, is the, the warrior who said, I'm not taking the shit anymore. So no matter how much they ostracize me, no matter how much they want to take me out, no matter how much they want to suppress me, I'll give my life to this thing. And what's happened is we've become a, a global society of people who are too weak to step up to the plate and go, I'll fight. And if it costs me everything, fine. But what I'm not going to do is let this shit continue to infect culture enough that it destroys my children, my grandchildren, the future of my nation, my call, you know, all of those things. And I, it's, it's a sad thing to me. And, and as men, what is really sad to me is that we've been told you can't be masculine. You can't be an alpha. You can't step up to the plate and be that brave warrior any longer because that's chauvinistic and it's, you know, oppressive and it's wrong or it's supremacist or what, you know, whatever term they put, put on it. And I see back in the list is just bullshit. Like my job not only is to provide for my family, to protect my home and, and to watch over the things that I've chosen. But I also have a moral responsibility to step up the plate and go, don't fuck up the world around me. Because when you do that, I'll come out fighting. I'll come out swinging. And if you take me out in the process, at least I went out for doing the right thing. But I'm not going to sit back anymore and just say, let's be comfortable. But the problem is, is there's so few of us who will step up to the plate and speak the truth because people are too afraid of getting canceled. And they're too afraid of being called crazy or they're too afraid of being disliked. Like, the hell would you do? If you don't like me, fuck off. I don't care. Like, I'm just here, you know. And so there's, like, here in the U.S., with Joe with Joe Exotic running for president, you know, people don't know what to think about that. He's a character. You know, they just think of him that way. They don't take it as seriously. Then I go, yeah, but the difference is Joe's the guy who's fighting for your basic freedoms to give the country back to you, to reduce the government, you know, to to fight for what this country, what this country was founded on, to get the fuck out from under the crown. You know, to basically say, hey, we don't have a ruling class. We have a nation by the people for the people. And to say we're going to live with freedom. Joe's Joe's the only one who genuinely steps up to the plate to say that. But people are so taken aback by somebody actually saying the truth anymore. And then they, they'll they say to me, oh, I can't believe you, you'll you you'll risk your reputation. And I'm like, I'm, I'm risking my reputation not for Joe. I risk my reputation to fight for this country, to fight for the future for my children. And so... I don't care if you think it's smart or you like it or you don't like the bottom line is there's going to be some warriors that step up to the plate and go, fuck it. I'm going to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to take the We're going to take this thing back. And I think we've got to do that with our culture. When you get to the trans issues and all those other things, like I have no problem. Like I'm, I'm friends with pretty notable, you know, trans and, and drag queen type individuals around the country and it, it, you know, here for the U.S. and it's easy for me to just say straight to you, I don't give a shit what you do, do your thing. Like if you've made your, you're happy living your life, you don't, like you said, don't fucking bring it around my kids. You know, yeah, exactly. don't figure this and, about yeah. to make it older. And the majority of the world think that way. It's 2023. The majority of people don't really care. A lot of people just want to go on with their life, but when it's getting right. through in people's faces, just mad shit. It's just. I've got kids, so I do everything in my power to protect them. And yeah. if I'm in that toilet, if my daughter's going to the toilet and some hairy ass man comes in identifying as a woman when he's clearly not, it's just that upsets me because I, it's right. not normal. Like you say, we've all got different friends from all walks of life. We had just had Pride right. Month there and everybody walking. Nobody's hating on anybody or gay bashing or hating on trans. I don't, I'm not, nobody's asked. It's just. When right. it's kids involved and they're trying to normalise mad shit and make out there's more genders than what they are and people going to prison for misgendering people and they've got pronouns. It's just tiring because people yeah. just don't f fucking want to get on with their life without having to rewrite history and change everything. Nobody fucking cares. But right. it's just when the media portray it and then everybody thinks they're targeting certain people. They're genuinely not. But when I see people like, videoing themselves, there was a man in the gym who went into the women's toilets, and then he went into the man's toilets, and you can just tell he's a seedy old fucking man, but yet right. the police couldn't do anything, the women were scared, and it's just all, oh, you can't misgender me, I identify as this, but I'm just going to start identifying as an MMA fighter, mate, and just start beating fuck out anybody I see doing wrong, mate. That's my Well, you know, job. it's so funny, because I, you know, part of this, I've, I've recently had 
you know, incredible amounts of like, we've had death threats. I've had them send the police to my home to disrupt my life and all this stuff. And part of it stems from an individual who can't stand the fact that in my social media lot, I talk about being 100% alpha and the kind of male that fights for truth and justice and fuck all the agenda, right? They can't stand that. They want me to be quiet. They want me to sit down and shut up. They want me to be like what they, what they often say is, oh, I just we want you to love everybody. I love everybody. I do. I don't have, listen, you can fuck up big time. I'm friends. I mean, look, I, I am good friends with Joe Exotic, regardless of what people believe or not. The man's in prison for supposedly trying to have someone killed. I love Joe. And even, even if that were true, and it's not about Joe, but even if that were true, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be his friend and love him. You know, I, I, I don't care if you've got a path. What I care about is you're not, you're not out there fucking up other people's lives. And I will get in the way of that. That doesn't mean I don't care about it. But what I'm not going to do is I don't, I'm not the type who's so weak. And this is where we come to as a society across the globe. We become, well, to some extent, there's some countries that get a lot of flack, you know, that for not putting up with stuff. Uh, and then they get called hatred, you know, the hateful and genociding and all this stuff. But like they quit, they don't put up with it. You know, there's some countries that the further you go east and the closer you get to Asia, man. Some dude dressed as a woman shows up in a girl's bathroom and tries some seedy shit with some kid. They're going to kill him. Like, and I'm not necessarily saying you kill him, but they deal with the issue. And I think we've just gone so far. We've become weak. We just yeah. become weak. We're weak minded. And then we're just weak, period. And, yeah. I, you know, oh. I get so much hatred for stepping up and going to hell with it. I'm not playing the weak game. I'm not doing it. I'm not yeah. doing it. And yeah, it, it, it might hurt when you step up to it because you get punched. You get knocked down a time or two. Okay, like what major great movement in the world and what great leader hasn't gotten the shit kicked out of him a time or two or gotten knocked over? They did. That's what it takes. You got to be willing to take the hits. Yeah, who the fuck wants to go through life, Michael, without any scratches, brother? You right. I mean, it's, it's just a big game anyway, and it's it's just mad. I'm not a religious man, and a lot of religions are kind of I don't know. Some I believe in. That's the fact. I don't. I just. I'm just open minded to everything. Obviously, you've got the Muslim community, which is very firm and don't take much shit. And you've got the Christianity, Buddhist. I'm not really. I'm just happy that people can be happy in life, be who they want to be, choose what they want to choose. Right. Just don't throw it in anybody's face. So back to Joe. Listen, great conversation so far. I love this kind of shit. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this, but this is what it's all about. Just having a conversation without arguing, without pressing people this is my beliefs and telling you you should believe in what i believe in you should be no just a conversation this is what That's life right. should be about and so much things could be solved better by just talking it out and just that's right but i always say it, we're all fucked up michael we're just fucking that's old right. lunatics everybody is we're just that's see exactly the world the way right. i swear we're all i've spoke to enough people now to realize if you're a billionaire homeless gay straight bi trans we're all fucked up we we'll yep. all talk a good game and just we try and wing it as much as we can. But That's right. For for Joe, so what is Joe's actual charge? They get twenty two years in prison. How did the charge come about? And did he know he was going to prison? Let's talk about it from then. His court case. Yeah. So I mean, the primary charge goes back to obviously the story that you see in Tiger King, which is this attempt to have Carol Baskin killed, and it's a supposed plot that he hired Alan Glover, who you see in the show, who came to work there, a former, a former convict, well, you know, a, a convicted felon, it supposedly paid him $3,000 to go to Florida and kill him, right? And, of course, there's a lot of talk. Listen, Joe, Joe's never, this is what I love about Joe. Joe's what you see is what you get. So, like, he's, it's a genuine statement when he says, I wish somebody would just take her out, and she needs to go away. She's a pain in his ass. She destroyed his business. She was destroying his rights. She was getting in the way, not just of his. You see, Joe's been a warrior for the people. So he saw that she was trying to get in the way of the rights of other, like, of Americans. And he's like, I just won't take it. I'm not, I'm not going to take it. So he got vocal about it. And just like you or me, if anybody gets in the way of our business and they do it over and over again for a decade, I, we're all going to get vocal. Like, I'm going to be saying, fuck you, go away. You know, I'm going to beat your ass, whatever. Like, that's Joe. And so the, the basically... The, the entertainment officials at Netflix and other other folks involved with the, our Department of Justice here in America, they basically paid off and coached witnesses to give false testimony and in that particular charge. But that charge wasn't enough to stick. I mean, he could get he could get jail time for supposedly doing it, but not 22 years. 
And so in order to put him away for longer, they stacked charges on top of it, which was animal cruelty and, and in, intrastate movement of animals across state lines here in the United States. All of which are kind of, they're, they're like process crimes. It's like the bullshit they're trying to pull, pull off with former President Trump here in the United States. You know, it's, it's this idea, their, their, their take with Joe was, show me the man, I'll show you the crime. You know, there's 300,000 plus laws here in the United States. It, I can show me anybody. I'll show you how they broke the law somewhere. You know, we're, we're, we would all be guilty of something as a result of having so much law over our heads, right? And so uh, they specifically point to Joe killing five tigers and saying that it was animal cruelty. And that's what they charged him with. What the reason they were able to, it's a technical thing. So, like, I'm, I'm licensed by the United States Department of Agriculture to care for the animals that I have. And part of that care, my veterinarian writes up a protocol for when that animal needs to be euthanized because they're sick or old or, you know, whatever the, the scenario is. And my protocol says that I have to give them an injection in their muscle to make them relax, sedate them. Then I give them a shot intravenously to stop their heart, right? And if I don't follow that exact protocol, then I have violated a federal law of process, right? Well, with the tiger, and this is what people don't understand, and I spent a lot of time explaining this, specifically cats that are predators like tigers, everything's about a sense of smell. It's not the sight. It's the smell. It's the scent. So if you walk into an enclosure with a sick animal and you're carrying a syringe full of medicine to kill that animal, to euthanize that animal, the other animals around smell that same smell. So if you enter that enclosure and that smell is there and then that animal's dead because they smell death the minute it happens. Okay. So all of this is olf olfactory sensory reality. Then the next time you walk out with that syringe, their, their instinct kicks in and they'll kill you to make sure you don't kill them. Right. So the quickest and most humane way to euthanize a large animal, which listen, I, you know, I grew up around farms in the country. You know, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite farms I actually ever went to, though, was actually over near Dunkeld in Scotland, up with, up with the Highland sheep and, and the uh, cows up there. But they were they were killing sheep that day and using the bolt gun, right? They shoot them right between the eyes, right? Mm -hmm. It's instant and humane. There's no suffering. There's no pain. There's no... And that's how Joe approached me. When those tigers were sick and needed to be put down, he walked in and shot them. And he put them out of their misery. He did it out of compassion. But because it didn't follow what was written by the veterinarian on a piece of paper that's filed with the U.S. government, it gave them a technicality to charge Joe with five instances of animal cruelty, right? So they stacked all these charges and were able to get a maximum sentence over Joe by putting all of these charges together. After the fact, so no one, by the way, Joe is the first person to serve jail time for that animal cruelty ever in the United States. Okay. So it's a ridiculous reality. But when it relates to Carol Baskin and the conspiracy to commit murder, since, since the case and the trial and the show's come out, all of the individuals involved in testifying against Joe have come back on video testimony and sworn affidavits and said, we committed perjury. We were paid off and or coerced by entertainment officials or government officials to give false testimony so they could get this conviction to put Joe in prison. And since that time, Joe has filed an appeal. We're 15 months now since that appeal was filed. The Department of Justice in the United States will not see that appeal right now because they are waiting for a statute of limitations to run out at the end of this year so that the federal officials who did those corrupt things cannot also be charged with a crime. So if the conviction were to be overturned, you cannot go back then and convict the individuals who committed perjury and or corrupt practices, bribery, all of the sort of things that occurred. And so I believe our Department of Justice is covering for itself. And, you know, right now they put Joe in solitary because he's gotten louder and louder as we get closer to time running out on, on the statute of limitations. And so a month ago, when Joe was slated to appear on national television and talk about all of this, Within an hour of announcing it, they put him in solitary confinement and locked him down. He has no access to email, phone calls, any of those ways to communicate with anybody outside the prison besides writing a note. And, you know, and he has no interaction with people. I mean, it's it's really, it's really, really bad. But that's that's our American Department of Justice 
which is they will silence the ones who are calling out the corruption in the system. And, you know, they can't show that they did a bad thing to Joe because that would show correction. But of course, we're watching it here in America. I mean, we have a president whose son should be in prison for drug trafficking, for human trafficking, for all of these things. And he's protected because he's in the elite, you know, the elite. And Joe's not. Joe doesn't have any money to fight the case. So therefore, you know, you can't hire a big shot lawyer to get all this kind of coverage and help taken care of. And so he becomes a, a lost voice in the system, whereas the ultra wealthy or the politically connected get get a free pass when when their crimes are documented by themselves. I mean, Hunter Biden has, has documented every crime he's ever committed because he's a dumbass and it's all out there. We've all seen it. We can all get a copy of it. And yet they're like, yeah, it's not a big deal. We're not going to do anything. Like, well, yeah, but unless it's you've so got bad. money and if you've, if, unless you've got money or power, we're peasants. We're nobody. Right. Look at Epstein's fucking flight logs. Look at the names right. on that. It's never right. came out. It's never came right. out. Why? Because there's so much money. These people I wouldn't right. say they rule the world, but they've got a big percentage of how it operates and how to manipulate yes. the masses. And like I says earlier, human beings can be manipulated easy. We can the flight logs where. Glenn Maxwell just got to prison, but what happened? You've got Will Smith all over the world media right. slapping Chris Rock on the news. Big deflection. People forget. What about the right. kids? Obviously, we've just right. the, the the Tim Tim is it Tim Ballard? Yes, just released a documentary. Yes. Oh, I forget what it's called. Down Freedom. Yeah. Yeah, and but there seems to be a massive movement of people. People are just tired of it. People. A lot of people. People called you a conspiracy theorist then two years yep. ago, five years ago, ten years ago. You can't be a conspiracy theorist if everything comes fucking true. Right. Right. And that's the scary thing. How can people well, not see it, that? It, Eight it's billion wild. people on the so, planet. You know, when you talk about the human trafficking thing, so I spent a lot of years, I mean, 23 years now working in the country of Haiti and specifically working with orphans and, and child welfare. And I know Tim Ballard. Tim actually was an instrumental. I have a daughter that's adopted from Haiti, and Tim was very instrumental in making sure that the logistics around some of her adoption were were in place. So I have a special place for Tim and really respect him. But I and Tim will speak to it as well, I know, but I'm always careful about it. You want dirt on Bill and Hillary Clinton for trafficking and, and abusing children out of the country of Haiti. Man, I got to stack a mile deep. But of course, do I end up like Epstein? Because, you know, you, you have to ask yourself because then you go back to the Epstein thing and you think, OK, you've convicted. Ghislaine Maxwell was convicted of trafficking minors to no one. Like, that's essentially what it is. She trafficked minors, but basically to no one, because who the hell was she trafficking to? They won't tell anybody. So, you know, just like, you know, I had a good friend who went to investigate the Clintons uh, in their in their work of taking care of children in Haiti. And I we ended up on a plane next to each other flying into the country. And she told me what she was doing. And I remember telling Michelle, I was like, Michelle, if you do this, it's, they're going to get you. They're going to get you. And sure enough, three days later, they found her chopped up in pieces in a ditch in the middle of Haiti. And so it's this really crazy. And again, Joe's another one like, I, he's he's got cancer. He's not getting treatment. They're not feeding him properly. I mean, the man's right now having to brush his teeth with a dish rag. They won't give him a toothbrush or toothpaste. It's like it's it's human torture. What they do to people to keep them quiet. They would rather Joe die in solitary because the whole problem goes away than to deal with it. And I think that's the way that our 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 justice system across the world is working. Because I mean, even there in the UK. You got a member of the royal family we know is on the manifest. We know was part of trafficking kids and screwing young girls under Epstein's provision. And yet the most they did is take his HRH off his name. Like, who the fuck cares? I don't care if he stripped his title, put his ass in jail. I don't care if his name is Prince Andrew. Who the fuck cares? Like, you fuck with kids, man. Like, you got to pay the price. It's not okay. Like, it's just not okay. And yet somehow... You know, and I think you guys did 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 we not just have a guy like an entertainment executive who just, you know, came out that he was sleeping with minors and never he's treating him like he's a victim? And it's like, bro, like wake the fuck up. Like, no, you're not a victim, you're an asshole. Like Yeah, but I think that they came out with the mental health card or they came out as gay and then it's like a free pass. 
Nobody fucking yeah. cares. If you're abusing kids, if you're grooming kids, you're a fucking groomer. You deserve right. to die. You deserve life in yeah. prison. The Russian, the Russians have got it spot on. Life in prison. Life in prison. Australia. Yes. The thing about the UK, they get community service. They get let out of prison. They get lenient sentences to then change their name for less than twenty dollars. Right. Change their name. Change passports. Driver licenses. Why? Because the fucking high-end people here are all involved in my eyes. Not everyone. Right. You can't tar everybody with the same brush. But to get to that elite level, you have got to be involved in some sort of fuckery. I don't care who you are, what you are. Well, the, the elite I mean, control in the, everything. In the, UK and be, alone, yeah. in the UK alone, I mean, you've got you're probably the most notorious is Jimmy Seville. Yeah, and, you Savo. know, you have that whole story. But the man was in with the elite. So... Explain to me how nobody touching Seville is also guilty of the same thing, and we're not talking about it. Like, you know, you can make a doc. I mean, Netflix has a whole documentary on Seville, and it you just sit back and go, yeah, but look at all the people he was around and with. Like, who's dumb enough to think that somebody else wasn't somehow touching that shit and didn't know? That's my other thing. Like, if you know and you don't do anything, you might as well be the one doing it. It's sick. So, again, like, you know, when you look back across these, these breakdowns in culture, and I think it's really interesting, but this shows, again, our our mental weakness and aptitude has dissipated so much as a as a human race that we, we can take somebody like Joe, who Joe Exotic's one of the most notable celebrities on the whole planet right now in modern history because of a cultural sensation that happened during the pandemic. And the man's sitting in a false conviction. He's being silenced. And people aren't scratching their heads and going, man, something just doesn't seem right. They just sit back and take the narrative and go, there's nothing I can do. And I think that's, we do that. We apply that same thought process no matter who it is or what it is. So whether it's Prince Andrew sleeping with minor girls in a, on a private island or hell, probably in the palace for all we know, you know, I, I just like, we take this mental weakness approach to go I, I can't do anything so i might as well not question it. like bro yeah. we didn't rise up and have revolutions across this planet because people were weak-minded like this it's time i think it's time as a and, and i i'd say this in america a lot but i think it's everywhere in a modern society where we have to go man the like the woke mind virus thing has got to go we got to step up the play to go it's time to have a revolution and call for truth and fight for those who are are able to fight for themselves and and not be afraid of the elites. It's time to steamroll the bullshit out of this thing and get back to a place where, like you said, we can actually just live our lives and be yeah. happy people and live with freedom. I just think that the majority of people want to do it. It's just 8 billion people on the planet and it scares me. You only need to, less than 1% of those right. people to make a stand. And That's right. Got, your freedom back you've got That's some right. element of control don't get me wrong i believe there's got to be laws in this world because people are fucking scary and they yeah. run rag and like the laws are great for people not being harmed and murder and sexual crimes and uh, uh, you've got to have some sort of control and laws in place where people can sure there's got to be boundaries for human beings because yeah. if it was a free for all i believe the world would be in torment but it already is now and it, we go back to the epstein thing Prince Andrew, he was a known sex case. Epstein, Prince Andrew said they went to visit him for five days so he could break off his friendship. The fucking Prince of England has a way. It's just, I had a man on who worked at the royal family and he was talking about Prince Andrew had like 60, 70 teddy bears on his bed. Now that and is strange in itself, but I don't yeah. have all the answers, but as a human being, and I, I like to think I've got good intuition of who's right and who's wrong and what it fuck it's all about and it's just he done an interview and i think fuck me you're guilty as sin there's no, no yeah. you, these people are so above the average person that what they think they are that they think everybody's fucking fit dumb yep. as fuck because they're so used to yes men they think they can say well i was in a pizza shop and i don't sweat and those videos and photos are fake but the proof is there you went to we one of the biggest traffickers on the yep. fucking planet, not just one, but in multiple occasions, and you're supposed to be the prince of fucking England? It's just, yep. for me, it's just all fucked up shit, but the more we speak out, your life does become in danger. This ain't a sure. fucking joke. Me and you speaking like this ain't no joke, Michael. It's, right. it's fucking life or death, and you think, nah, but fucking this shit happens, and when you start getting a voice, you're a danger. 
If That's you right. don't fucking dance to our tune, if you don't tell you what we want you to say and you don't do it, then we what, wait to see what fucking happens. Yeah. And that's just happening. If you go through the fucking hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, the same tools and techniques are there. You don't abide yep. by the whoever's in charge. Well, you go missing. Nothing's changed. That's and right. when it does happen, people just think, ah, you're a conspiracy theorist. But right. the laws are there. The ones who get cancelled are the ones who are telling the truth. Yep. You know, it's interesting here in the States, and I think about this a lot. You know, President Trump was on track to pardon Joe. He was also really on track, and he should have pardoned Eric Snowden and Julian Assange and some of these guys who have exposed the American corruption. But I think even those at the top elite are being threatened by the top elite, and they get weak, and they just go, man, I can't, like, I can't, it's going to cost me too much. Like, again, like, at some point... You know, do I want somebody to take me out because I'm speaking truth? No, I want to be I want to be respected for speaking the truth. But the reality is, like you said, throughout history and, and, and throughout cultures all over this planet, those who call out the truth are martyred. You know, when you look throughout history, I mean, you can even look at the basics of certain things. The man who told everybody before you go into surgery as a medical doctor, you need to wash your hands because you're going to get germs in and kill people. They put his ass in an insane aside. Because they told him he was fucking crazy for telling people they needed to sanitize their hands before they went digging in somebody's open body cavity. Like, it's a simple truth, but the reality is, is when it becomes inconvenient and it's more costly to live in the truth, they martyr the vo- those who tell the truth. Oh, yeah. And look so, at, yeah, look at the man who made the cars run on water. Poor right. bastard disappeared the next day. Fucking right. dead. Killed him. Right. Everything. Yep. Everything on this planet should be free. They don't need to. Be, there doesn't need to be money. There doesn't need to be oils and petrols and fuels and whatever it is. It's just all control from cigarettes well, to alcohol you know, to you drugs. Talk about this, it's the give and take of society, right? And you think about you go back to, and again, I you know this is hard for Americans to grasp because they just have an economic like a, a, a an industrial economic view of existence because this country is just a couple of hundred years old. And it was built on dollars of trade and and all of that. But you go back to cultures like like yours that have existed for thousands of years, and villages didn't operate on money; they operated on on goodwill and trading services. Hey, I'll 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 put the shoes on your horse if if you'll give me corn. You know, I mean, it was yeah. just a give and take of a common decency of taking care of your fellow human. But you know, you even think back. I asked my grandpa. Uh, you know, a long time ago, when we're talking about just like domestic abuse type things and the way people treat each other. And I, I said to my grandpa, I said, what did you do back in the day? Some dude's beating his wife. He goes, the rest of us men in the neighborhood get together and go over and knock on his front door and tell him you're going to stop doing that shit. And he goes, and if he didn't stop doing that shit, the next time he saw us, he was going to be able, he wasn't going to be able to do anything on his own ever again. He'd be, he'd be eating every meal through a straw. You know, he's like, yeah. he's like, because that's the way humans are supposed to interact. There's a give yeah. and take and accountability and responsibility. And and the problem is, is again, we've become lazy and weak minded. And then we bind this narrative. And and this is what's really sad because we've got this mental health issue that's pervaded our culture. And I think a big part of it stems from everybody's being told, depending on what angle you come from, you are not the way you and I just said it. Like we're all fucked up. But what they're being told is you're you're fucked and you're not okay. So you can't open your mouth and speak to anything because something's wrong with you. You know, you don't like somebody or you don't agree with this or because we don't all agree, you're a fucked up person. Like, and and people have begun to believe that they think something's wrong with them. So they don't lean into intuition and decency, responsibility and accountability any longer. And they wait for somebody else to tell them what to do and how to do it. Yeah. When did Joe get cancer, Michael? Joe has been, we, we are this year i think this is year number three since his diagnosis for prostate cancer and uh and again he's not getting the treatment that he needs currently uh you know without he's not getting any any proper nutrition and you know my my fear is as a result of those things regardless of a pardon or not joe's life is going to be cut short because of just a lack of care you know, lack of resources because in the, in the American prison system, which I know this is true. I mean, there are worse prison systems for sure, 
but it's like human trafficking. I mean, they've got him in there. The longer they keep him in there, they make money. You know, whoever's running the prison makes money off of Joe. And if they don't have to spend that money to take care of Joe, they get to put more in their pockets. And so there's just this gross negligence and lack of care for humankind. And listen, criminals are criminals. And even if Joe was a true criminal, it doesn't take away his humanity. You know, and it doesn't take away the accountability or responsibility that we're, you know, short of, execu you know, an execution and a, and a death sentence, you are still tasked with the responsibility to care for the basic human needs. And even Joe right now, nobody's taking care of the basic human needs. You know, he's he's locked in a small six foot concrete cell with no interaction with people. And in the United States prison system, when you're in solitary confinement, the only contact you can have with another human being is to have your shackles put on or taken off. Um, or if you have a medical emergency, the guards are not allowed to touch you. So you got to think about this from a human, human nature standpoint, like regardless of your connection to somebody else, the human touch by another human just reminds your soul you're alive, right? So when you put somebody in a, in a complete deprivation of not even getting a handshake or a touch on the shoulder, of being locked away without any stimulation, no reading material, no listening, nothing to keep your mental stimulation up, no proper nutrition, not the ability to bathe or to, you know, execute basic hygiene, you are literally driving someone to the edge of being completely broken, mental insanity, emotional breaking, and and ultimately physically. Because when we start to lose ourselves emotionally and, and mentally, our physical pays the price because all of those things come out in the way our bodies react, right? So what they've done to Joe, I mean, they're essentially... I mean, they're essentially it kind of a, it's, it's like waterboarding. It's like this place where they basically put him to say, we're going to slowly torture you till you die. And we don't care about the outcome because he's, t and, and, and sadly, this is true. And again, I've got good friends who have been in prison. I have good friends who are currently in prison and some of them for some pretty atrocious crimes. I mean, I'm, I've actually become friends with some notorious serial killers because I had a, I had a real curiosity of how does this human nature of somebody regardless of the level of their crime like what happens to that person because they're still a human being still breathing like how do you maintain any sense of humanity and whether they're entitled to dignity or not i don't know you know i'm not the judge of that but i really care about the the, the state of a human and i look at this in the prison system in america they don't care you're you're a piece of trash you're you're a meal ticket for those at the top you're paying salaries because of your presence and they don't give a damn whether you are healthy or okay or stable or anything because really and truly you know at the end of the day if they let joe die in prison they're going to stick somebody else in that same space and they're going to make the money again because it's a broken system it's driven by money it's driven by greed it's driven by power and there's a lack of care for a human being and again i think that's pervasive throughout our culture as a whole which is funny because what are we doing as a as a culture everywhere across the planet we're protecting minorities and we're trying to humanize all of these things instead of looking at the greater whole and say, how do we, in fact, care for our fellow human being as a whole, not just somebody wants to cut their wiener off or, or, you know, somebody with a different skin color or all of that, but rather the whole of humanity. How was Joe treated in prison? Like trash. Now, by the other inmates, he's, for the most part, he's, he's really loved by the other inmates. Um, Joe's very caring. He gives the shirt off his back. I mean, he'll empty out his commissary account to provide for somebody else before he takes care of himself. So his fellow inmates, um, you know, a number of them that are even out now, uh, that I've spoken to, they love Joe, say he's the kindest person in the world, but the, the prison officials, they, they don't put up with Joe because Joe's a voice that speaks out against the corruption. So they treat, they abuse him. They physically harmed him. They're always mentally getting in the way. Um, they they do not treat him well at all. At how all. close? How close was Joe being getting a pardon from Trump? How is that accurate? I think that he I think he probably would have ended up with it, but that day that the meeting was to take place was January sixth, with here which here in America has become quite a day of notoriety, and uh, it kind of derailed a lot of things because that was the day that. President Trump was supposedly going to review all of the pardons that were there for the end of his term. Um, and of course, that never occurred. So uh, and as a, as of current, no one in the Biden administration will even 
take a meeting to even consider, uh, you know, reviewing Joe's case for the opportunity and a pardon. They, not much less the Department of Justice won't even review his appeal. So it's very evident the way the system is just hijacked here in the United States to protect the elite and ignore everybody else. So Joe's running for president, did say? Is that correct? He is. So how does mm-hmm. he do that from prison? It's very difficult. Not, you know, certainly not going to skirt around that. But constitutionally, here in the United States, you do have the right and freedom to run for office from a federal prison while an inmate. This is Joe is is the second person ever in the history of the United States to uh, put together a presidential campaign from prison. Uh, but for Joe to do that successfully, it's taken our team, myself and a, and a, a good number of other volunteers. We're all voluntary, uh, you know, to serve Joe out of our own our own time and money uh, to to help this because we believe in why Joe's running. Um, you know, what's been interesting is the media kind of has ignored Joe, which is funny because the media has never ignored Joe. They, you know, Joe's great for clickbait and headlines, but his presidential campaign, they have, for all intent and purpose, acted as though it doesn't exist because he's disrupting the narrative. He's not falling into line with the typical campaign promises of, you know, lower lowering, uh, you know, are, are raising the, the wages and protecting the minorities and all this. Cause Joe's back to the fact that let's go to human decency. Let's let some things fail. Let's fix our economy. Let's get rid of big government. Let's get rid of all the extra taxes. You know, let's go back to the basics of just having life. And they don't like that. So uh, they justify it by there's no way the man could get elected because he's in prison, but that's not true. And I think if more Americans and, and more people across the planet, I watched this in other countries, where they got tired of the politics and they got tired of the politicians and they finally said to hell with all of you guys in the establishment, we're going to go find the rogue guy and put him in office because we need a normal person. We need the average American or the average wherever country you're from to step up and finally represent us again. Somebody who understands the average guy. Nelson Mandela, he spent over 20 years in prison. That's right. He done wonders for South Africa, man. South Africa's a dangerous place, I think, though. Yeah really dangerous now i've never been but just i've got friends there and they're just it's scary people just yeah. getting their cars and killed and shit it was fucking yep. mad but then the world's mad in a hole so how yeah. serious is this then for joe to really go forward with it or is it a publicity stunt or does he genuinely believe it can make changes how how does it work and what's his method of thinking behind it, that yeah it, it's very very genuine joe really does believe that yeah, joe's i mean our campaign slogan is what do you have to lose because it's really joe's reality he's got nothing so worried to get out of prison he's at he's at square one starting over with nothing so he doesn't have a business all he's got is the reputation of the tiger king and that's good or bad depending on how you view joe's character um you know and so for him he built his business he built the zoo he built his life he built his family on his freedom to live his life how he wanted you know to pay his taxes fairly to live without disrupting somebody else's life and so he he knows that's what this country is supposed to be about. He wants to represent that, give it back to the people and get rid of the the woke mess that has become our government. It's a very serious campaign. Um, does it help in getting exposure to his case and his story? Of course it does. So it does. It, it plays a role as a publicity stunt, but the heart behind it has nothing to do with being a publicity stunt. It is very serious. This is Joe's third attempt at running for office. He ran for office. He's the governor of Oklahoma. And then he. this is his second time running for president of the United States. Uh, he's much more serious. We worked really hard to raise funds to make sure that he's on the ballot in, in key states, that he's accepted across all 50 states here in the United, here in the United States. And um, we really believe that that there's a chance, should people hear his voice and understand that when Joe talks about reducing the size of the government and getting rid of all of our extra agencies, it's real. It's not a political talking point. It's not a sales job to the American people that it because those are the very groups of people who destroyed Joe's life. So he has purpose and meaning behind why he wants to do that. When he talks about reducing the size of government and giving the control back to the individual states then allowing someone's vote to actually count, he means it. And Joe's approach to that is you got to, you just got to tear it down. You got to let it fail. Some things need to burn to the ground, maybe even literally. I don't know, but he's not afraid. You know, Joe's Joe's real attempt is, hey, we're not, we can't live in this 
everybody gets a medal, everybody gets a prize society anymore. This isn't a blue ribbon society. Some things fail. We got to quit bailing out the banks. We got to quit funding other people's wars. We've got to turn back on drilling for oil and natural resources in our country because it's our power. It's how we built our economics. We've got to tap into our natural resources and sell them to other people, not be the one buying them, not be the one giving all of our resources away. We have to turn our eyes back into this nation and fight for America first, period. And then we can help other people. But but the, the problem is a lot of people and a lot of other candidates that are running for president here in the States right now, they say all those things. But the truth is they are establishment politicians or they're the elite wealthy. And there's some good men in the mix, I think, you know, that mean well, but they don't have the personal reasoning and drive because they haven't been the average guy ever in their life. So to be empathetic to what the average American goes through, Joe's the only candidate who truly can speak to the average American experience and actually be a representative of that. How long is Joe in solitary confinement for? Joe, Joe is going to be, I mean, we don't really know exactly how long Joe will be in solitary. He's been in now for a month. The last time that they did this to Joe, they left him in solitary confinement for four months. That's a long time, eh? Yeah. Was that the last time you spoke to him before he went in? Yeah, the last time we had a conversation. Now, we write back and forth in, in letters weekly. Uh, but as far as my last conversation was about three days before they put him in solitary. So what's the plans then for the future when Joe gets out? What's the structure that he's going to do? Yeah, I mean, when, when Joe, regardless of the campaign, I mean, if we get Joe out of prison sooner than later, and there are some laws that pass here in the United States, hopefully in the next few months, that will reduce his sentence naturally, uh, should they pass. So he would be home in a, in a few more years. Um, I think for Joe, Joe just, if he's not going to be serving in a public office, for Joe, he just wants to go back to having a normal life. You know, but I, I tell Joe this because Joe wasn't, Joe wasn't famous when he went to jail. And I told Joe, I said, you'll never have a normal life again. Like you can't just go down to the the convenience store and get a get a soda and not be and not be recognized. Everybody knows who Joe is. So I said you're gonna you're gonna have to re-enter this world and learn how to live again in a new way that you've never known before. And uh, you know we take it one day at a time. But for me, you know, from my point of view as a friend of Joe and as someone who would fight tooth and nail for Joe's freedom, but also for Joe's opportunity to serve others. Um, I just, I just want to see Joe get out there and, and I want to see Joe find a sense of, of peace. And I, I tell Joe, I've told him many times, maybe the smartest thing you'll ever do when you get out of there, if you're not, if you're not serving in public office somewhere is to disappear, <laughs> just disappear, man, just go live your life and be happy. You know, there's so many people that want notoriety and want fame and Joe loves being out there. Um, but, uh, you know, and I think Joe will, I think Joe will still be an entertainer no matter what. Uh, you know, I can see Joe doing a lot of entertaining, and I think he'll spend a lot of time outside of the United States when he does get out of prison, because I think that the rest of the world loves Joe, and they are not they are not disillusioned by the mess that our government and our media has has told the lies about Joe all these years. Does it get a lot of fan mail, Michael? Not as much as you would think. You know what's interesting, and and maybe you've experienced this with other people. Everybody probably assumes that, that Joe gets all these things. So then they go, I won't write a letter because he probably won't see mine. Or I won't send that because he gets so many. And I think every almost everybody thinks that. And so he doesn't get as much as you would think. And so I've told everybody, like everybody can go over and they can see all of the resources. Like when we talk about the corruption in his case, it's on joeexotic2024.com. Um, and so they can go over there and look at that. But there's a... a his address and everything's there for folks to write him a letter. And I tell everybody, write Joe a letter. It encourages him. It lifts his spirits, especially right now while he's in solitary. Those notes of just encouragement or somebody just saying, hey, thank you. Yeah, Joe appreciates when somebody, if all somebody said to Joe was, hey, during the pandemic, life sucked pretty bad. And thanks to what you guys did with the Tiger King, it just it gave me a little joy. You know, it, it added a little something to my life at a dark time across the across the globe. Uh, it means a lot to Joe when he hears those things because Joe wasn't, he didn't get to experience it the way we did. Do you think he'll ever get out? He'll get out. He'll get out as long as his health does not deteriorate to the point that he cannot survive. 
Joe will get out. He'll be an old man if he has to serve his whole sentence. He'll be nearly 80 years old. But, you know, if he had to serve all 22 years, I mean, he's already served five. And, you know, so he's got about 17 years left on the actual sentence. Um, you know, he'd be nearing 80 years old by the time he got out if he has to serve at all. I believe with the laws passing, Joe will find himself out of prison before his 65th birthday. And if his health continues to deteriorate, maybe a compassionate release to allow him to take care of his health in, in whatever time he has left. But, um, you know, my hope is that the eyes of the world, but the eyes of our leadership here in the United States would be open enough to take another look and grant Joe that pardon so that he can just go on with his life. Yeah. Like I say, the Tiger King was massive in the UK. I loved that. I thought it was, it was great entertainment. You don't really see, obviously, when you speak to you and hear about Joe, it's, it was a mad bastard on the Tiger King, but it, the way you speak about him, it doesn't really portray that picture. It just looked like a loose cannon on the, yeah. on Netflix, and it didn't really respect the animals, and you were hearing that he killed them, and he was trying to kill the woman. But when you actually break it all down, it, if he's everything that you say, then he probably is a decent guy. But yeah. the Netflix sells stories and him going to prison probably made it even bigger. So you don't even yeah. know who was behind that because it's all money at the end of the day. And if people can get more money and they're happy to throw people in prison, then by all means they'll fucking do it. You know, so. I think at times they put little bits and pieces in the documentary well, on Netflix to to let people maybe see a little piece of Joe. Like when you see that Joe did Thanksgiving or Christmas dinners and fed the whole community. These were things that Joe does all the time where he would give whatever money he has or whatever resources he has to help somebody. Like Joe's one of the most generous and giving people that I've ever met. That He's very serving and you miss that because you see the showman, you see the flamboyant, loud mouth, you know, fun Joe. Um, but you don't get to see the full picture of a man who literally, you know, they make jokes about it in the show too, with the men that, that he shared his life with his partners, you know, giving them gifts and stuff all the time. Joe did that because he just is a giving person. Like it's his natural thing. It wasn't for any other purpose. And if Joe bought him a car or gave him a new gun or what, you know, whatever you see in the show, it wasn't for any other purpose than Joe just wants to give to people. He loves people and he loves to give to people. And I've experienced that personally as a friend of Joe's where, you know, Joe's offered time, you know, he only gets so much time when he's not in solitary, he gets 500 minutes a month to have a phone call. And Joe would carve out a chunk of that time uh, to, to show up with me, to create content, to do things. And I don't have a lot to offer Joe other than just being his friend. Right. But you know, Joe, Joe offering that to me when at times maybe he needed to needed to try to do more for himself. You know, and so Joe, Joe is just a very giving, incredible person and, and he loves people. Who was the kid? Was it the second one? The kid killed himself. Yeah. Who, yeah. who was that? It was that in Carol's It's one of his Joe's? partners. And I, I think that it was a pure accident. You know, I've talked to folks who were there, um, when that occurred, it really was a pure accident. I think there was stress because again, what people don't really see in the story is the the zoo was suffering the business was suffering joe was suffering from the stress and anxiety because of what carol was doing to them and what carol was doing to their business and uh i think you had enough of, of a, a stress and things going on that the story looked really a lot more intense than it was it was a tragic accident you know it was a it was a it was a bad position and i think everybody who was there at the time was just walking through stress and anxiety. But, you know, he didn't go shoot himself because he was depressed. He was playing irresponsibly with a firearm. And uh, and it happens. Unfortunately, it happens. But is there going to be any more seasons of the Tiger King? If Joe gets out, you can get you can guarantee it. Now, the other characters, the Jeff Lowe's and all those guys who were on the show, they act like there always is, but those guys are the biggest con artists and liars on the entire planet. And they're always telling people, oh, we're filming another season. We're starting this whole thing. They're not. They're they're full of shit. They're lying all the time. And the only other person who could probably pull off another season is Carol. But I think the, uh, the, the public as a whole knows Carol's full of shit. Nobody really wants to hear from Carol anymore. I think people are waiting to see, is there going to be a rebirth of Joe? you know, down the road. And 
what's going to be hard, I think, for most people to realize, at least by the laws here in the United States, regardless of Joe getting a pardon, it's highly unlikely that the the Department of Agriculture here will ever grant Joe the opportunity to build another zoo. But I also don't believe Joe has the intention to build. He want, he loves animals. He wants to do the, the animal thing. But I think the risk of rebuilding Joe Exotic and the GW Exotic Zoo and all of that, that it'll 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 be something different in chapter two of Joe's life, um, you know. But but uh, there would definitely be because we we've, we've collected footage uh, from prison. We've collected information during this season, these five years, and uh, there's enough there's enough there for two or three more seasons, honestly. But it all it all kind of hinges on whether Joe is out of prison because it won't work for Joe to be in prison. They don't allow us to to produce or go and do any type of production inside the prison facility. Where did the, all these animals go? Did they get took off them? So the, yeah, they got taken off of him. Carol took a uh, Carol took a lot of them. Uh, you know, they Carol, Carol got her hands on a lot of them. Um, they got put in different sanctuaries, and then a number of them were just euthanized. You know, when organizations like PETA get involved, and they're not all bad. I mean, Brittany P at PETA did come along and help Joe. She even testified in Joe's behalf uh, at the trial. So, you know, I, I'm quick to sometimes speak poorly of PETA. Uh, at the same time, some of the animals that were placed by PETA were ultimately euthanized because the facilities could not afford to care for those animals. And so, unfortunately, a lot of animals met their demise because uh, they were you know, uh, disabled or had some sort of a special need that other facilities weren't willing to care for. And so those animals were destroyed. What about yourself, Michael? What's your plans for the future? I'm just living my life, man. 100%. I, I'm, I'm, listen, all I care about at this stage in my life is that all of my kids grow up to be productive adults, man. I've got, you know, I've got seven kids. Two of them are already gone and out of the house, five more to go. I got, I got the next one out this year. He'll graduate high school. I just want him to turn out to be good adults, get out there and do something great in the world. And uh, other than that, man, I'm happy to live my life, take care of the animals. And uh, when I have the opportunity to speak up and speak out, speak truth and encourage other people, my voice is, is always available to speak, speak to what can and should be in this world and, and hopefully inspire others to, to be brave to quit being cowards and to speak truth and step up for what, what needs to happen in this world so we don't go completely off the deep end. <laughs> yeah, good on you, brother. Listen, you're a great speaker, very switched on, and it's the kind of stuff that I believe in as well. I believe there's a lot of people think that way, but not a lot of people have got the balls to speak out against it, but yeah. very great speaker. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Would you like to finish up on anything, Michael? How can people get involved with the Tiger King? How can people yeah. show support for you? What's your social media platforms? What's your websites? Sure. Yeah, the the, play, the main thing people can go look at is joeexotic2024.com. Uh, they can go there. All the resources are there. But they can go to joeexotic2024.com slash evidence because a lot of people are curious about why we are so adamant that Joe was wrongfully convicted. And so you can see everything there. It's a great resource. And then for me personally, the best place, I mean, I'm on Instagram and all the social media platforms and it's at Spider Monkey Winston. So they will see the monkeys that I've talked about. Uh, I see the work and then other things are connected there. Uh, you know, our nonprofit and that kind of stuff. But the, the most important thing is to go check out joeexotic2024.com and uh, plug in and understand what's happening with Joe. Would you like to finish up on anything else, Michael? That's it, James, man. I am so grateful. Thanks for thanks for working us into a conversation and connecting with us. And you're, you're really making me feel getting out of plane and getting back to Scotland for a visit yes. before team wrong, brother. Yeah, let me know if you're here. We're hoping to get to America soon as well. So, We'll try and get a catch up and um, see what we can do with our side yeah. and our network. But listen, I really enjoyed this conversation. Very powerful. Keep doing what you're doing. You've got, you know where I am anyway. So if you need anything, mate, you know we can help from our Absolutely. side for what we can do. But listen, God bless you, Michael, and speak to you soon, brother. Thanks, dude. Big time. Cheers, bro. Take care, bro. Thank you. All right, buddy. Have a great Cheers, day. Brother. Same to you, mate. Bye.